Should rugby players be allowed to play their club rugby wherever they want and still play for their national team? This is what I want to tackle on this particular video and it comes hot off the back of the Welsh strike threats and the players demanding that they should be able to play away from Wales and the uh, the cap limit should be reduced or got rid of. It has been, an agreement appears to have been done where it's been reduced and now in England, as the RFU were trying to thrash out a long-term deal with Premiership Rugby and with the players, this has reared its ugly head in England as well. Because fundamentally, there's not a lot of money around. And consequently, players' wages are being significantly hit and they're having to make tough club versus country decisions in a lot of cases. Uh, now, this builds on a video I did last week where I was looking at the different models of how domestic rugby and national teams are structured in different leagues. And this, yeah, this is just kind of building on top of that. So go and check out that one if you haven't already. Please do leave your comments uh, as well. I'm really interested. I've had some brilliant comments on some of these topics. So I'm fascinated to know what you think. And I've, I've learned a lot as a result. Uh, now, you can basically break down any uh, top level international rugby team into one of a few bands of uh, the way they organise their business. And in, in the case of Argentina, Fiji, Italy, Scotland, South Africa, Georgia, and a number of others, players for those national teams can play their rugby wherever they choose. And it works for them, for the most part. There are some quite significant rugby unions around the world, England, Ireland, France, New Zealand, to name four, very significant ones, where players must play their domestic rugby inside the borders of that country in order to represent the national team. And then you have others like Wales and Australia, where there's a bit of a hybrid approach where uh, they like to keep uh, as many players as they can within their borders, but they accept they can't keep everybody. So they have a cap limit. Uh, of a number of test matches and or years service in the domestic league before you can go abroad. Uh, so I'm just going to take this, the Gallagher Premiership as one specific example to kick this off. This is what I, I work for BT Sport working on the Gallagher Premiership, so I, I know this very well. But these are the same issues that will happen be happening in every league and conversations that will be happening. So the thought is that if in the Gallagher Premiership, England's domestic league, they allow England players to go and play their rugby in France or Japan, for example, that this will lead to a mass exodus of players. And the consequence of that will be that there will be a significant reduction in the interest, in the viewers, in the people going and buying match day tickets at these grounds, and also in the merchandise that's sold off the back of these star players. And another negative aspect of this is that as an England squad, the coach, Steve Borthwick at the moment, will have far less time with his international players altogether. Because currently the way it's structured is you have to play your rugby in the Gallagher Premiership in order to be eligible to play for England. And as a result, like at the moment, in fact, the weekend just gone, the England squad stayed in camp, all stayed together. Jack Willis, who plays for Toulouse in the French top 14, and he's only in the England squad because that was as a result of exceptional circumstances after his club Wasps went bust. Um, Jack Willis went and was on the bench for that game again. Was it Racing 92 they played? A good game, actually. Um, and yeah, Jack Willis was on the bench. So he had, he's had to fly to and from South France. Um, oh, no, it was in Paris, but to and from France. And he's also sat on the bench and, and been involved in a game. Whereas, and, and that could detrimentally affect his chances with England. He's arguably the reason he missed the Scotland game to start the Six Nations. So that, that that is the argument as to why this would be a really bad idea. And these are all things that when you look at Ireland and you look at France, particularly Ireland, I'd say, because France still have the, the pull of the clubs and they play loads of games in the, in the top 14. The players get flogged in that league. Whereas in Ireland... You know, the 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 IRFU have plenty of control over the players, so they they kind of can pick and choose which players they want to play when. So uh, the Irish team, you would think, will be in peak condition come this weekend when they play against Scotland. They're going to need to be, aren't they? So these are the negatives. These are why it shouldn't happen. The reality on the ground is this, though. Clubs, due to obvious reasons over the last few years, have had their, their income massively hit and they drop the salary cap 
from six and a half million to five million pounds. That means in the league, remember two clubs went bust, so a lot of players suddenly were out there on the open market. Eleven clubs rather than thirteen clubs. There is now fifty-five million pounds to be spread across every rugby player in the Gallagher Premiership. That's a lot less than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, having looked at the, the, the squads, you broadly speaking, Premiership squads are between 50 and 75 players. I think Sale are on the lower end and Exeter Chiefs, for example, are on the higher end. But when you when you average that as a salary, that equates to somewhere between 66,000 and 100,000 pounds per player per squad. Only it's not done by average. Every player does not get that. And when you break it down, and there was the miners report that was released uh, last year, which detailed a lot of information on the salary, more information than we've ever had before. And you realise that that if you have 100 caps, uh, 100 appearances in the premiership, as you can see, that, that that's how much money you earn. If you have 50 England caps, you're... you're, you're, you're value jumps right up from from 205k to to 325k and the top 4% of players in the Gallagher Premiership the very elite players in the Gallagher Premiership earn over 400,000 pounds when you put that in the context of a 5 million pound salary cap that means there are a lot of players not being paid very much money for what is an incredibly demanding job I would favour something like that happens in the RFU and uh, RFU in the NFL, where there is a minimum amount of money you earn because this job is tough. So if you're picked, if you take to the field doing this job, there should be a minimum expectation of how much you earn. So with the reduced salary cap, with the, the with all the other pressures that are on at the minute, this means that when players are coming to renegotiate their contracts, they are being offered fractions of what they anticipated they would have been at this point in their career. And consequently, I don't see any way out of this other than relaxing the rules, as is the option on the bottom. If, if you don't agree with relaxing the rules and letting England players or any national team player go abroad, then I think what you have to do is reduce the size of the squads. And you can only really do that if you play fewer games. And this is where things start to butt heads because you play fewer games. You can probably expect that you're going to get less television money. There is the argument about scarcity is valuable. And again, the NFL is a great example for that. But the fewer games part is one that people don't seem to want to address when they also want to demand that England players have to be playing in the premiership. Because what you're effectively asking those England players to do is to take a whole load less money in order to try and play for their national team. Of course, this wasn't an issue 30 years ago when it was an amateur sport, but now we're in a professional era and the careers are short and one injury and it can all be over. So just to address some of the negatives, right? So there's going to be a mass exodus of England players if we allow this. Is there though? Is there? Because here's my thought. What are the two leagues that most players will go to? Japan and France. They're the, they're the only two leagues really which have the, the space for those players and the money for those players. And in France, the opportunity for foreign players to come and play in the French top 14 is reducing significantly because of the GIF quota system. I mentioned this on the, this on the video last week. Currently, 14 players in every matchday squad of 23 have to be French-born or French-eligible or French-developed in through their academies. That's going up to 16 next season and I believe 17 the year after. So the spots in the squad for non-French players is going to reduce significantly. Also in Japan, where loads of money's been about with all those corporations owning teams and loads of opportunity has been there. However, they're introducing a target where non-Japanese players can only make up 20% of a squad. So the number of opportunities there are reducing significantly. So I would put it like this. It's only going to be the very, very top players that go. And those very, very top players will be established internationals, more than likely, and they will have already given quite a bit of service to their domestic league and their club. And so my thought is they deserve the opportunity to go 
and strike while the iron is hot and earn money while they can, which, well, let's just examine the impact that has. I mentioned Ireland firstly, though. I, I, I love the, set, the setup they've got, and this is what I mentioned in the video last week, because it, it fits Ireland. It works for Ireland. The French system works for France. The New Zealand system really works for New Zealand. The South Africa system works for them. And I think it's really important, uh, just to emphasise what I said on last week's video, that you just do whatever's right for your particular system. Ireland have central contracts. They have no salary cap. So they have the flexibility to pay people the money they're worth. If they have a crop of players who are incredible, like they do right now, they can find the money somewhere, whether that's through private sources or through the IRFU or through clubs who are well supported, so have the money and the financial backing. They can find the money if the players demand it to keep them in Ireland. They also have veto powers. So if Munster wanted to go and sign a an international... Uh, Aaron Smith, let's say. They wanted to sign Aaron Smith at Munster. He'd be brilliant. However, the IRFU can say, no, you're not doing that because we want to develop our Irish scrum halves. So they have the power to limit how many foreign players and what position those foreign players can be in. So the Irish system is a great example of one that's all joined up and all works. And I think the, the English system is an example of one where some people want to have their cake and eat it. They want to demand that English players stay in England to play for England, but also don't want to pay players what they're worth. And it, it just creates a really difficult situation where you've got players who are having to make decisions that they don't want to make and I would argue don't need to make. So three players that have gone from the Gallagher Premiership and played abroad, uh, all in the back row, all England internationals, I think this highlights the different motivations people have for moving where they play at the minute. Zach Mercer, he went because he thought he was being overlooked for his country, so he thought he'd go and experience something and develop himself as a player, which he absolutely has done, and I hope he makes England's World Cup squad. Got high hopes for him. Jack Willis, he was a, a victim of the financial mismanagement of Wasps and of rugby in general in England through uh, the last few years, and he couldn't find a contract in England, took one up in, in Toulouse. Sam Simmons, he's, going, he's weighing up the fact that after the World Cup, he'll be in his late 20s, He's former European Player of the Year. Probably this is at his peak moment for a contract. He's at peak earning potential right now. And he's decided that on balance, he will take the risk of going to France, taking the guaranteed high money that you can get there and losing out on the potential of England caps and the money that goes along with that. Because England players get around about, I can't remember now, is it 15 or is it, I think it might be 15 to 20,000 pounds per game. Uh, for playing for England. So if you're an England international playing 11 games in a year, uh, you're earning a significant amount of money. However, if you don't play or you get an injury, you don't get any of that. So uh, that's the, the motivations for players going. I would argue, in fact, let me just jump back to that. I would argue it's worked out really well for England that this has happened. So Zach Mercer, he has got a better player while he's been in France. He was always thought of as someone who was kind of had all the flair and all the skills, but could he do the dog? Could he run in heavy traffic? And he's gone and proved in a really brutal league that he can absolutely do that. Jack Willis is playing around some world-class players, and that is only going to improve what is already an incredible set of skills that he brings to the table. And Sam Simmons, well, this is... that. Let me hold that thought because I'll come back to Exeter in a minute as I move on to Jack Knoll. And I've put Sam Simmons in mind here because Jack Knoll, established in England international, but out of favour right now, may have played his last England game. Don't rule out him coming back, but he may well have played his last England game. And he's been a great servant for club and country. He's going to be leaving, as has been announced. Don't exactly know the destination just yet. Lots of rumours at the minute. We'll wait for that to be confirmed. Should that be a bad thing for Exeter? Well, the fans are going to miss him. Will it be a bad thing for England? Well, he's out of favour just now, but coming through, Faye Wabosi and Josh Hodge, you would imagine they'll get even more game time. And they are very, very exciting, very, very young talents coming through that are English. And is that not a good thing for England? An established international who's probably passed his peak 
powers, moves abroad, leaving his big salary behind, which can get spread between multiple young players who can be developed in a really good environment and play a really good standard of rugby. Is that not best for England? Also, look at the inside centre position. This has long been talked about, and thankfully, uh, Ollie Lawrence seems to have answered the prayers there and uh, is the, the long-term solution at inside centre. But man alive, have England had some issues there down the years. And when you look around the Premiership, there are two South Africans, an Argentinian, a Scot and a Welsh international filling five of the 11 jerseys as first choice for their club. Bernard Janzi van Rensburg for London Irish and Andre Esterhazen for Harlequins, two South Africans. Uh, you've got Cam Redpath playing for Bath and Scotland. You've got uh, Matthias Orlando playing for Newcastle and Argentina and Nick Tompkins playing for Wales and Saracens. So this is another little aspect of it. When you think about the what Ireland do with their limits on foreign players, when you look at what France do with their GIF quota system, when you look at what Japan are now looking to do, limiting the number of foreign players, I think this has to be a big joined up thought and you cannot have it both ways. You cannot say to English players, English qualified players, you have to play in England if you want to play for your national team and then also make it okay for as there to be no limit on foreign players. I know there is a the EQP um, bonus, so you can earn yourself a little bit extra money if you have a certain number of English qualified players in your matchday squad, but clubs don't have to do that. They don't have to. So I just think it needs to be all joined up. Either you let your players go abroad, this would be my choice, you let your players go abroad and play where they want, because only the very top players who've established themselves and been around for a while are going to be the ones that take get that opportunity. And then you and then you invest the money in the younger players who are coming through. Or you demand that England players stay in the premiership, but then you limit the number of foreign born players so that you're working in the best interest of the national team. And that's what this has to come down to. Every one of those different models you look at. Scotland and South Africa, it works for their national team, it works for their domestic clubs. Ireland, it works for their national team, it works for their domestic clubs. Where Wales and England find themselves at the minute is that they've got a system which doesn't work for the clubs and the national team and the players. And there are solutions which can solve all of those things. But this is where rugby's at. We're at an existential point, we're at a big, a big old crossroads and there's lots of big decisions need to be made and uh, let's hope they make the right ones what do you think they should do uh, leave your comments uh, hit subscribe thank you very much if you have really appreciate it if you would and I'll see you in the next video lots of Six Nations build up content coming your way very shortly